my first conscious memory of hearing the bat call, the daughter of a sound, the still small voice of divinity, happened on a sojourn into a thin place during a summer camping trip when I was just 13. My family had traveled to the west coast of Vancouver Island to what was back then a mostly unknown treasure. Pachina Bay is by far one of the most beautiful places in all of creation. These days, hikers on the Pacific Rim Trail often begin or end their hike by camping at Pachina Bay. But way back then, the bay was only accessible by the most treacherous of logging roads, and there was no official campsite back then. You simply asked the members of the First Nation for permission to pitch your tents on their land. As a result of this splendid isolation, we spent several weeks as the only family camped in this idyllic bay. One of the main attractions at Pachina Bay were the pods of whales that are attracted to the bay. Pachina Bay, with its warm Pacific waters heated even more by virtue of its shallow depths, attracted schools of salmon, lingcod, and halibut, who make up a veritable smorgasbord for the pods of whales that continue to visit the bay to this very day. One quiet afternoon, my brother Alan and I were playing on the shore. Our parents were sound asleep when the whales arrived. I'm not sure how many whales entered the bay. Our count was based on the number of spouts that emanated from their blowholes. So there could have been half a dozen, or there could have been only one whale. Anyway, we did what any self-respecting kid would have done in our position. We jumped into our rubber dinghy and we paddled as fast as we could, determined to chase whales. Now, the dinghy wasn't totally inflated on account of the leak that it had sprung the day before, so it made it difficult for us to work up much speed. But I must tell you, when that first whale jumped up out of the water and we saw the telltale signs, those white patches on its side, we moved faster than you'd think two kids in a slowly deflating rubber dinghy ought to be able to manage. Killer whales. These days they are called orcas, but Alan and I, we knew exactly what they were, and they certainly weren't beautiful orcas to us. They were big, giant killer whales, and we knew that we were their lunch. Suddenly, one of those magnificent monsters rubbed up against the bottom of our dinghy. I went headfirst into the ocean, and I sank like a stone. The underwater sight of two killer whales caused me to open my mouth to scream and water rushed into my lungs. I knew I was about to drown. And that's when I heard the small voice. It was a very quiet little voice deep down inside of me. At least I think it was inside of me. The small voice within my very soul said only one word, swim. And swim we did, all the way back to shore. And when our heartbeats returned to normal, we decided that we'd made a clean escape and we chose not to share our adventure with our sleeping parents. As frightened as I was, I was determined to get close to these magnificent beasts. So the next morning I rose early and as the mist was rising over the water, I paddled out toward the mouth of the bay, and I waited. It didn't take very long for me to realize that I was in the presence of something much larger than myself. As a whale gently brushed the underside of the dinghy, a strange calm came over me, and I was not afraid. It was as if my whole being was alive. 
one of the whales rose out of the water, and as she came crashing down, I marveled at the magnificence of this beast. After what seemed like hours, but was probably just a few minutes, the whales moved on, and I was left to clumsily put it words onto the depth of my experiences in what the ancient Celts would have called a thin place, a place where the lines between the ordinary and the sacred are very thin, and we can see, feel, touch, hear the mystery which lies at the very heart of reality. There's a story in the Hebrew scriptures which resonates with me in light of some of my own experiences in thin places in the presence of mystery. You'll find this story in the first book of Kings. It's about a prophet named Elijah who was struggling to understand the will of the one they knew as Yahweh. Yahweh, the Hebrew name for the mystery that we call God, which can be translated as I am who am or I will be who I will be or simply as the great I am. Our Hebrew ancestors, Jesus' very own kin, understood the mystery which we call God as the verb to be. For this mystery is being itself. Anyway, poor old Elijah suffered in his quest to bring the word of Yahweh to his people, and in the midst of his turmoil, Elijah was lost and fearing for his own life. As the ancient storytellers weave their tale, Elijah was familiar with the voice of Yahweh, so much so that Elijah dared to argue with the voice of Yahweh. One day, Elijah demanded of the voice, I have been very zealous for Yahweh God, omnipotent. The people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death by the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Elohim, that's an ancient Hebrew word which we translate simply as God or Lord. The word Elohim literally translates as El, the generic term for a God, put together with the feminine form of the word for majesty. So clearly, Lord is not a correct translation for Elohim, the God who is described as more than one queen. But I digress. Elohim, the God who is the feminine plural of majesty, said to Elijah, go down and stand on the mountain in the presence of Yahweh, for Yahweh is about to pass by. Imagine the mystery, which is the I am, the very essence of being, is about to pass by. Our Hebrew storyteller paints such a vivid picture of the thin place in which Elijah stands. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks by Yahweh's power, but Yahweh was not in the whirlwind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but Yahweh was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but Yahweh was not in the fire. And after the fire came a still, small voice. A still, small voice. Our English translations do not do the Hebrew justice. For after the fire came a bat coal. Bat coal, the daughter of a sound, or as some translations put it, the daughter of a voice. Elohim, the mystery which is the God known by our ancestors as the God who is the feminine plural of majesty, the one Elijah knew as Yahweh, the one who is the verb to be, the I am, this one comes to Elijah in the daughter of a sound. Have you heard her, this daughter of a sound? Back when I was just 13, I didn't really have words to describe what was happening to me, but the experience was so vivid that over the years I've often traveled back to those moments of wonder. 
It was as if I was connected for the first time to all that I could see and to more than I could see. I felt a strength within and a power envelop me, and even though it overwhelmed all my senses, I was not afraid. I had a confidence which goes beyond words, a confidence which began with one word, a word uttered by the bat coal, the daughter of a sound which spoke a still small word from within me, a kind of assurance that I was an intricate part of something much bigger than myself. The colors of the bay were more vivid than before, and it was as if I could actually taste the contours of the mountains. I fe felt held and cared for in a way which defies explanation because it is beyond words and yet grounded in the word which welled up within me. All too soon the experience ended and I was left feeling like I'd traveled beyond the bay to a place beyond time itself. It would be years and years before I could put a name to where I'd been, but there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that I had, had encountered the holy in that daughter of a sound who spoke within. The holy, the mystery, the divine, the one we call God. Years of reflecting on the various times in my life when the bat coal, the still small voice, the daughter of a sound, has welled up within me, has led me to a word which I believe comes close to describing the one whom I encountered all those years ago, the one who I long for to this day, the one who grounds me in this life, and that word is love. Love in which we live and move and have our being one with all that is, love, which lives in, with, through, and beyond you and me. This love speaks to us in a still small voice, the bat coal. May the daughter of a sound speak within you and be heard within you so that you may know the power of the bat coal and embody love in the world. Swim. Be. For you are one with love, which is being itself. Being beyond the beyond and beyond that also. Our lover, beloved, and love herself. <laughs>